Hey, I'm Charlie Thompson, and welcome to Chapter 2, Population and Migration. Before we jump into the content, let's take a look at what the key learning objectives are for this chapter. How and why do populations change? Generally, they increase, but not always. We'll take a look at that. What are the six demographic indicators? There are six key factors that demographers, people who study human population, pay attention to. We'll take a look at those in depth. What is the demographic transition model? So in the Western countries, Western Europe and the United States, the populations went through similar phases of rapid growth and then declining growth and then stabilization. And the the name for that process is the demographic transition model. It's accurate for the West. It's not as accurate for other countries. So we'll talk about what it is and why it works for Western countries and why the demographic transition model isn't really accurate, doesn't really reflect what happened in less developed countries. What were the three revolutions? There were three periods in human history when the human population increase increased. The rate of increase increased, which led to a big jump in human population. There were three times in human history when this happened, and we'll discuss those. Why do people migrate? Well, they leave a place for a reason, but they go to someplace else, sometimes for a similar reason, sometimes for a different reason. How does migration affect communities? We'll talk about that. To what extent are current population trends sustainable? That's a really, really, really good question. So why are we looking at this stuff? Why are we, why is it important? Well, uh, understanding geographic patterns and characteristics of human populations. So if you know where the people are, and if you know how they're growing at different rates in different places, that helps you understand cultural, political, economic, and urban systems. Populations grow and decline over time and space. It would be good to have an understanding of that. Causes and consequences of migration are influenced by cultural, demographic, economic, environmental, and political factors. So now we're getting back, shifting from population to migration. So the first thing I want to look at is this video. So I thought, uh, I mean, you're going to watch this on your own, but it occurred to me, I always have a lot to say in the classroom and there's a bunch of stuff that's important. So we're starting off at the beginning. I'm going to turn off the closed captions. Modern humans evolved in Africa about 200,000 years ago, and we've spread out from there. So uh, just for <laughs> uh, to set up the story, going way back to the beginning, everybody came out of Africa. Everybody, 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 all of humanity has traced, uh, traced its origins back to Africa. So they'll show, yeah, they, they, we're not going to start 100,000 years ago. You can watch this part on your own. So it's going to start at year zero. So we're going to cover the last thousand years of human history. Each dot represents a million people. It doesn't mean that there was a million people right there. It just means that in that region, if you added everybody up, there was a million people. And then they'll show us important little, little icons to let you know, oh yeah, this important thing, the Han Dynasty, the Roman Empire, whatever. Oh, and we started. So yeah, not a whole lot of people, 177 million people. We've got the Roman Empire starting. We've got Asia and China which today are incredibly important centers of human population. They started doing agriculture first, and so they really got a head start on the rest of the planet in increasing its population because they did agriculture first. And yeah, I was going to say, in it, the, the first couple minutes are just very, very slow because not a whole lot happens. What do you start off, 177? We're up to 180? Ooh. We're back down to 180. We've gone 300 years and we're like just about where we started. Mm -mm. 
178 million. So we're 500 years into it. The fall of the Roman Empire, peak Maya. Six hundred, and we're exactly so for the first six hundred years of, yeah, not much, not much going on. Birth of Islam. Now we have slow, gradual increase, beginning it looks like around six or seven, six or seven hundred. Now we're up to two hundred. So in the first thousand years, we went from 177 to, uh, so we, well, added almost a million people. Uh, I'm sorry, added almost a hundred million. Now we're up to 300 million. You can see the increase is increasing in the places that had large populations to begin with. So now we're, oh, Mongol Empire reaching across a lot of Eurasia. In fact, I think one-sixth one sixth of people in Europe actually are carrying genes that they can trace back to Genghis Khan. We've got the Black Death. Not doing a whole lot. Like when you go back and look at this on your own, play it back a couple times. Look at the Black Death pre and post Black Death. Doesn't do a whole lot. Killed a third of Europe. Now we have the theft of humans from Africa. Now we're up to 500 million. And the industrial the industrial revolution, there you go. 1 billion. So now we've hit 1 billion. World War One, we're up to 2 billion. And we're going to hit 3 billion, 4 billion, 5 billion, 6 billion, 7 billion. And that's where we're at right about now. We're just over 7 billion humans. But you can see for the first thousand the first 1,500 years, in fact, the first 1,700 years, going back to uh, common era zero, not a whole lot of change in human population. It's only very recently, very, 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 very recently. In fact, we only have to go back to, I was going to say about 1960 or so. If we bring it up, bloop. Yeah, right in there someplace. When I was born, there was about 3 billion people. The planet has more than doubled its population in my lifetime. So I think one of the big, super, super, super important things that really can't be emphasized enough is the massive human population present on Earth is a relatively recent phenomenon. That it took hundreds of thousands of years for us to reach 1 billion it, we went from 1 to 2 billion in about 120 years. It took about 20 years to hit from 2 to 3 billion, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, 5 to 6, 6 to 7, 7 to 8. So scrolling through again, going back from about 3 billion people, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And that's about right where we are right now. We're just over 7 billion, 7, I want to say 7.7 .7 billion, someplace in there. So it was a projection. They they run it out a little bit. Seven, eight, nine. That's about right. So some of the key points that I want to make, the centers of population, India and China and Indonesia. So India and China, they did agriculture first. The domestication of rice was one of the most important events ever in human history. It explains the population density of India and China. And then we've got other centers of population. There's the East Coast, there's Europe, there's Sub-Saharan Africa. Indonesia is huge. And then there's areas without 
large population amounts. For example, the Western United States, it's very dry, scattered populations. The Amazon is increasing in population due to direct government efforts of the Brazilian government opening up roads to the interior so that people can move from, from cities and occupy former rainforest to deal with their population problem. That's one of the reasons that they keep uh, constructing these major highways through the jungle. It's to encourage people to move out of the cities into indigenous territory occupied by native people and uh, living there. So other areas, the Sahara, it's just too hot. Much of northern Eurasia, it's just too cold. Same thing with Canada, just too cold. It's frozen. The tip of South America, it's glaciated. There's uh, lots of snow and ice there. The Kalahari Desert is a desert. The Tibetan Plateau is very, very high and cold. I think the average elevation is around 15,000 feet. On the other side of it are the Taklamakan and Gobi Deserts. Roughly 75% of Australia is desert, so you get, you get people living on the coast in a couple towns, Sydney, Adelaide, Perth, but not a whole lot of people in the interior. All right, so the key points, once again, most of the growth has happened incredibly recently. Uh, you can see the, the growth curve, the J-shaped exponential growth curve, turning the corner, I don't know, sometime around 1950 or so, when it went from very, very slow growth throughout all of human history to incredibly rapid growth. All right, back to lecture. So that covers population growth. I put a link to the Worldometer site. Uh, in fact, let's take a look at that now, as long as we're here. It's pretty darn cool. So this is the world <laughs> world o meter Worldometer. And I've got it set to population. Current population, 7.8 billion. Today, we had 246,000 births, 103,000 deaths for population growth today of 143,000 people. So today, we added <clears throat> 143,000 new people. And then it's got other births this year, deaths this year, population growth this year. So we're adding, we're, we've we have already added 7 million people, and it's only February. It's got lists of population by the largest countries. China, 1.4 billion. India, 1.38 billion. The U.S., 332. Here is population over time. So you can run it back. It goes back to, I think, 300. I'm not sure why they stopped there, but you can play around with that. It's got growth rates. That's very, very nice. 2% growth rate, 1965, 1966. When I was born, the growth rate was 2.05%. 1919, or sorry, 2019, the yearly growth rate is 1.05%, which means that we're going to add around 81 million people a year. So the rate of increase is about half of what it was, but the population is just about double what it was. So here we've got yearly change, median age, fertility rate, density, urban population, some good stuff, world population forecasts, milestones by region, population density, world population by religion, hey, that's some geography there, religion, world population by country, pop clock, all right, that's some good stuff. So I hope you play around with that page because it's got all kinds of good information on it. And also the census, the census department, the U.S. census, has a similar pop clock for U.S. It's got detailed figures for the U.S. and then general, general numbers for the world, just like average increase or actual increase. So here's another chart of human population going back to uh, about 10,000 years ago, the beginning of agriculture. It's interesting. On this, the dates are B.C. and A.D. I think in the Graves text, they are B.C.E. and C.E. I will try to always use Common Era and Before Common Era rather than Before Christ and Anno Domini because of the religious basis for this. Anno Domini is Latin for the in the year of our Lord. So that's great if you're one of the, you know, two billion people on the planet that is some sort of Judeo-Christian, or Christian, rather. So if you're one of the roughly two billion people on the planet that's Christian, 
yeah, this zero being the year of your Lord is accurate. For the rest of the planet, it's just not, though. And it's not scientific. It's so, so the before common era and common era is a bolt in replacement. It just says, fine, we'll just, we'll just keep the numbers the same, but we're not going to say before Christ and in the year of our Lord. We're going to say before common era and common era. So everything after zero is common era. Everything before zero is before common era. Anyway, uh, 300 million. So the entire population of the entire planet was slightly less than the current population of just the United States. 2,000 years ago, the entire world's population was similar to the population of the United States right now. About 1,800, we hit about 1 billion. 1,850, 1,900, 1. 1.6. 1,950, 2.5. We're up over 7 billion today. And again, you can see, I think this this graph does a much better job of showing just how dramatic that that transition was around 1950, going from slow gradual increase to extremely rapid exponential increase. U.S. population, 248 million, 281 million, 308, 330. According to the U.S. Census Department, we've got about 332 million people in the United States right now. One birth, and this is from the POC clock, one birth every nine seconds, one death every 10 seconds. We get a new migrant, somebody immigrating every 600 seconds. So it's a net gain of one person every 52 seconds. World population in 2002, 6 billion. Uh, world population. So uh, in 2010, we were adding 75 million. This year, we're going to add 81 million people to the planet. So the increase has increased by about 6 million people. The increase is decreasing, but it's still a positive number. So these, these pink bars represent the increase in millions per decade. Is it a decade? Every two years? 1900, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. No, that's right. It's decade. 1950, 95, 2050. So you can see that the increase is decreasing, but we're still increasing. Another chart. So the, the graph looks better if you start it at 1950. You can make it look not nearly as frightening going from 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 7 to 8. Uh, probably 20. Before 2030, we ought to hit, we'll hit 8 billion. The growth rate, as I've mentioned, as you've seen a couple times now, from the 1960s, the global growth rate hit over 2%. Uh, it's now, I was going to say, now it's about 1%. It is expected to keep coming down, but it's not zero yet. This is the length of time to add a billion. So it took 118 years to add the second billion, 37 years to add the third, 15, 13, 12, and then it's supposed to start spacing back out. But you can see we're still adding and adding and adding and adding. Yeah. The world gained. In, in 2002, we were adding uh, a Boeing 737 every minute, every day, two sports stadiums, every month, another Indiana, every year, another Egypt. That's still every year. Now we're adding about 81 million, another edition of 81 million people to the planet. Those people live in seven key regions, Africa, East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Europe and North Asia, lots of Asia and North and South America. Hey, oh, there you go. So if you add up everybody living in the minty green section, that's a billion. So Australia, New Zealand, South America, North America, Greenland, and Iceland, it's about a billion. Northern Africa and Western Europe and Russia, it's about a billion. Central Asia, so Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, Iran, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, half of China, and Mongolia add up to about a billion. That chunk of China is about a billion. 
If you have both Koreas, Japan, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, Myanmar, Laos, and Thailand, that's about a billion. And then just this chunk of India and Sri Lanka is about a billion. So they left out part of the rest of India because India is like 1.38 billion. So they left, 308, they left 380 million people out. So if you take India and you shave off 380 million people, you're left with a billion. And the part that you shaved off is about equivalent to the population of the U.S., maybe the U.S. and Canada, someplace in there. So seven, seven key regions, each of them has about a billion. This map is called a cartogram. And cartograms are diagrams, they're maps, but the size doesn't represent the physical size. So with a cartogram, in this case, the physical size of each country represents the size of the population, not the physical area of the country. So, so I think cartograms are really fun. They're often very useful. They challenge our assumptions. Uh, like on the maps, Russia always looks huge. Canada always looks huge. Part of that is cartographic distortion because they're high latitude features. If it's a Mercator map, they're just going to look bigger. But on a cartogram, because we're just looking at numbers of people, yeah, Canada, like 30 million people. Uh, Australia, what, what happened to Australia? Australia got all tiny. India and China got hecka big. Nigeria is pretty big. Brazil's pretty big. Indonesia is pretty big. Uh, and then a lot of European countries don't look so big anymore, especially compared to places like Indonesia or Nigeria or Brazil or Pakistan or Bangladesh. So cartograms are fun for playing around with our perceptions. Here we've got people per square kilometer. So this is population density. It's the number of people divided by the square kilometer of land. And you can see there's a couple, well, I'd give you four, maybe, well, I don't know. So we've got the Eastern United States. We've got Western Europe. We've got India and China. Indonesia is incredibly dense. Parts of Nigeria are pretty dense. But you can see there's lots of places where there just aren't people. Australia, the Sahara, the Kalahari and Namib deserts, the Amazon rainforest, the frozen parts of Canada and the United States, and Greenland and Iceland and Russia. Just too cold. Australia, the Sahara, and the Kalahari desert, just too dry. Which is what this diagram is saying. Uh, sparsely populated, dry, sparsely populated. It's too wet. It's too dry. It's perfect. Let's pack everybody in there. It's too cold because it's too high. Perfect. 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 Nah, it's too dry and it's too cold. So this is looking at the spread of humans for the last, I don't know, what is this, 7,000 years or so? Going back to 5,000 BCE. Uninhabited, mainly ice, hunters and gatherers, and small-scale agriculture. Agriculture in the Fertile Crescent, agriculture in China, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, and now we've got large-scale. Uh, let's see, wait, BC 5000, and then we've got one. So now we've got India and China on board with extensive settlements. And you can see the, the shrinking areas of hunters and gatherers. So back in the day, before, before 5,000, before prior to 10,000 or so, or 9,000 or so, uh, all of humans were hunters and gatherers. We were all hunters and gatherers. And agriculture started around 10,000 years ago, so around 8,000 BCE in Asia for the most part. And as a result of agriculture, with agriculture, you can feed more people on the same amount of land. And with agriculture, cities took off. And with cities, we have division of labor, we have specialization, we have a leisure class, and massive population growth. Which ties into, I mentioned before, the three revolutions. The first revolution was the agricultural revolution around 8000 BCE, when people started growing rice. 
So how do we look at population? There's three different densities. There's population density, or rather arithmetic, arithmetic density, people divided by land. That's the most important. Physiological is people divided by land that you can grow food on. That's a more realistic number, maybe. And then agricultural farmers per land, easily the least interesting, the least useful of all of them. So let's just look at the arithmetic density. Oh, look, uh, China and Afghanistan and Pakistan and Vietnam and the Philippines and the Koreas and where'd we go? Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, the Philippines, Japan, North Korea, South Korea, Nigeria, Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Belgium, uh, England, and Northern Ireland have much higher densities than the rest of the world. Physiological density is people per square kilometer of land that you can grow food on. So the U.S. has a pretty low physiological density. Norway, not surprisingly, has a really high density. India has a very high density, which implies that there's actual physical limits to population, at least for India, if they were eating food that they grew. Also, Egypt, very, very, very high physiological density. Most of the people in Egypt live by the Nile. So there's a lot of unusable land. And then agricultural density, it's farmers per square kilometer, which is kind of a function. The more or the fewer farmers you have, you either could have a more developed country like the United States where you have really large farms. Less developed countries have more people working, more people working the land, fewer machines. And so you have higher numbers of farmers per square mile. So I, I, yeah, I just don't even understand agricultural density, to be honest with you. I mean, I understand it. It just doesn't tell me a whole lot about population. It, it tells me more about the development and the economic situation of the country than it does necessarily just their population. Here we've got population growth, 1950 to the present, showing that the increase you can see was taking off very, in, very rapidly, very rapidly. And then it's kind of just plateaued. The annual increase is kind of stabilized. The increase rate continues to come down, but it's still positive. So we're still growing. And that's important. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Population estimates by continents, Africa, Europe, incredibly important. Okay. The three revolutions. The three revolutions represent three periods in human history when the population growth rate increased. Once the population growth rate increased, the actual population increased. So we've got the first one, about 8,000 before Common Era, the agricultural revolution. People transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. It led to the rise of cities and wars and massive increase in population. Prior to the ag revolution, the population was around half a million. The entire population of Earth all the humans on Earth, about half a million. The natural increase rate is the percent increase rate of, of the population, 0.001% for a doubling time of around 59,000 years. So I'll get into, in a minute, the relationship between the natural increase rate and the doubling time. 1750, we saw the Industrial Revolution with the development of steam engines, which meant that you could put power wherever you wanted it. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, prior to the Industrial Revolution, if you wanted power, you were limited to animal power, people, or oxen, or donkeys, or horses, or you were limited to wind power with windmills, or water power with water wheels. So there were seasonal and spatial limits on power with the advent, with the creation of the steam engine. Now you could have power any place you wanted it. You were no longer limited by the natural world. This was a huge transition. At the time of the Industrial Revolution, about 1750, the population was around 800 million the increase rate had increased to 0.06% for a doubling time of just over a thousand years. 
and then 1950, the medical revolution. 1950 common era, the medical revolution. By 1950, the population was up to 2.5 billion. The natural increase rate was just under 1% for an 82-year doubling time. So we went from a doubling time of, what was it, 59,000 years to a doubling time of 82 years. So the medical revolution was things like antibiotics, systemic antibiotics that you could take. Um, vaccines were another big, there were, there were three parts to the medical revolution. There was antibiotics, sulfur drugs, and then later penicillin. There were vaccines for things like polio, and there were insecticides for things like malaria. So the combination of these three things really brought the death rate down, kept people from dying, which kept them alive longer, which increased the population. I don't know why I put this here. It's another view of population density of the world going from very, nobody's there, 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 nobody's there almost nobody's there, to everybody's home, everybody's home, everybody's home. And if we could see New York and New Jersey, we'd see everybody's home there too. Demographics. So this is those six factors that I was talking about that we use to keep track of what a human population is doing. There's the natural increase rate, the crude birth rate, the total fertility rate, the infant mortality rate, the life expectancy, and the crude death rate. So we've got the natural increase rate, the natural increase rate. To calculate the natural increase rate, you take the crude birth rate, which is, which is the number of babies born per thousand people, and you subtract the crude death rate, which is people that die per 1,000 people. The crude birth rate minus the crude death rate gives you the natural increase rate. You can take the natural increase rate and use the banker's rule of 72 to figure out the doubling time. So if you take 72 and you divide it by the natural increase rate, you get the doubling time in years. So if we had two countries, one of them is doubling, uh, one of them has a natural increase rate of 2%, the other has a natural increase rate of 3%. So the first country, it has a doubling time of 36 years. 72 divided by 2 is 36. So every 36 years, that country is going to double. With a 3% doubling rate, they'll be doubling every 24 years. 72 divided by 3 is 24. So if you started off with a million people and you went forward through time and the natural increase rate was the same of 2% or 3% for 72 years, after 24 years, the first country has doubled. After 36 years, the second country has doubled. 48 years, we're up to 4 million. And then in 72 years, the first country has a population of 4 million and the second country has a population of 8 million. So the whole point to this is a small difference. Well, well, it looks like a small difference, right? The difference between 2% and 3%, it's only 1%, but that 1% represents 50% of 2%. So it's actually a 50% increase. But when we look at the numbers for natural increase rate, they're all going to be low. Like the highest natural increase rate we're going to find is probably around 3%. So we're going to be comparing like one point something to one point something else. And the, the reason I'm going over this is small differences in the natural increase rate over a period of time have massive consequences. This country is half the size of this country. And the difference between a 2 and 3% Natural increase rate, not a whole lot of difference between those two. So looking at natural increase rate, uh, yeah, this is our first of the demographic maps, and they're all going to look the same. At this point, I tell you in lecture, yeah, if we change the title and change the color scheme, all the maps would look exactly the same. There's like this huge Africa. Africa stands alone. 
I mean, there's Mongolia, Papua New Guinea, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Jordan, and Iraq. But for the most part, Western Europe, North America, Japan, Australia, New Zealand are going to be in the low sections, and much of Africa and the Mideast is going to be at the high end. So if North America, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand is one way, then Africa and the Mideast is going to be the other way. In this case, they're doubling every 36 years. It looks like we're doubling every 72 years. So our doubling rate is below 1%, looks like. Some of these countries actually have negative growth, where their population is decreasing. These countries have relatively rapid growth. In fact, it says 2% and above, and I hate it when they do that. How high does it go? Does it go to 3? Does it go to 40? Show me. But not now. So next up, crude birth rate. Is the crude birth rate babies per 1,000 people? Crude birth rate, uh, it's the same dealio. In fact, now we've got even, it's, it's exactly the same, right? Western Europe and Japan are in the lowest category. Africa and the Mideast are in the higher category. North America, Australia, New Zealand is in the lower category. So I think we're going to consistently see Western Europe being the lowest, Africa the highest, and then the U.S., Japan, Australia, New Zealand are going to be either the lowest or second lowest category. So the crude birth rate, the places that are growing the fastest are having the most babies. And it's a big variation. Big, big, big. These countries, the, the births per 1,000 persons below 10. So Italy, it's below 10. In Mali, for example, it's over 40. So that's a fourfold spread on the data. It's a massive range. Crude birth rate. Next up is the total fertility rate. That's, you take the total number of children and you divide it by the number of women. So it's another way of thinking of it is it's the number of women that, it's the number of children, it's the number of women, it's the number of children that a woman would expect to have in her lifetime. The average number of children per woman. Infant mortality rate is the number of babies that die before their first birthday per 1,000 babies. There's also a huge spread for that. The U.S. consistently gets its butt kicked by most of Europe. We are not, in this, in this case, we're in the lowest, uh, the lowest division, but that's because of the way they've divided the data up. Below 10, yes, we're below 10, but there's, a, there's still considerable variation between the U.S. and Japan and Singapore and some of the Western European countries. But the number of children being, uh, the number of babies dying, 40 and above, I believe back in the 90s, Afghanistan led the world. Afghanistan had 195. I think the U.S. was 6 to 9, someplace in there, and Afghanistan was 195. So it's the same pattern. They're having lots of babies. Part of the reason they're having lots of babies is because lots of babies die. If we can break that cycle, the birth rate drops dramatically. So we've got infant mortality, life expectancy, how long you'd expect to live, uh, Africa, Mideast, below 70, North America, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, well, Canada and Western Europe are in the highest category. The United States, because of our medical system, I'd like to point out, we are the only industrialized nation without Medicare, without medicine for all. We are the only country that does not have socialized medicine for everybody. The only industrialized nation. It's, it's embarrassing. It's tragic. We are the only country that has medical bankruptcies as well because of the medical bills, because we don't have socialized medicine. And crude death rate. The crude death rate is the only one of these that doesn't go with the other. So if you showed me a map of any of these first five, natural increase rate, crude birth rate, crude, uh, total fertility rate, infant mortality rate, life expectancy, any of these five, you show me one of them, I would say, oh yeah, if this country's high, this other country's high, and everybody else is low or vice versa. If yeah, for natural increase rate, for crude birth rate, total fertility rate, infant mortality, and life expectancy. 
If the U.S. is high, then Western Europe and Japan are high. If the U.S. is low, then Western Europe and Japan are low. Crude death rate, uh, it's the one that doesn't match. There's, there's a couple different reasons you could have a very low crude death rate, and they, they, they're not related at all. You'll see. So we've got crude death rate. For example, Mexico's crude death rate is the same as Libya and Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq and Turkey. So how do you explain that the U.S.'s numbers, in fact, Mexico's numbers are lower than any Western European country, lower than Japan? So there's two reasons that you could have a low death rate. One of them is you have an extremely young population, so everybody's too young to die yet. I think that's what's going on throughout Africa. For, these, for some of these countries with very low death rates in Africa and Mexico, it's because of the demographic profile of the population. Um, the other reason, so you could also have a high crude death rate because you lack medical care. Like these people probably never, ever, ever will see a doctor ever, ever, ever. Some of the countries like Japan, like Western European countries, like North America, we've got, if you're wealthy, you have access to a doctor. And that keeps the death rate low. So everything else, they go hand in hand. If one of those five is high, the other, the other four are going to be high. But the crude death rate, it's an outlier because you could have a low death rate you could have a low death rate from advanced medicine. You could have a low death rate because you have a lot of young people. You could have a high death rate, ironically, because of advanced medicine keeping more old people alive, and then more of them represent, they represent a bigger chunk of the population. So when they start dying, it looks like you have a high crude death rate. Uh, population over time crude death or crude birth rate. So now, because this is my data and I made this map, uh, now we'll get some better numbers. So eight to 13 is the lowest levels, crude birth rate and the highest uh, down in Africa, 34 to 50. And also uh, Laos, crude birth rate. Total fertility rate, again, is the number of, of children per woman. The highest, 7.4. So that means that the average family is 9.4. Assuming it's a conventional uh, two parents and kids family, the average would be seven. The average is 7.4. That's children per woman. So you throw in a husband and wife and you're up to, up to nine and a half. Nine and a half for the average family size in these yellow, country, in these yellow countries. Uh, 2.1. 2.1 is replacement fertility. So below 2.1, or rather, if you're at 2.1, you're going to have zero population growth. Zero population growth is about 2.1 because not everybody has kids. Some people die in accidents. So you'd think that two would be total re would be replacement fertility, but it's really 2.1. 2.1's replacement fertility. So Canada, much of Western Europe, China. Uh, Iran, those countries are decreasing over time. Infant mortality rate going from, yeah, like I said, in Europe, two to five. That's because they have socialized medicine, two to five. In the United States, five to 10. So our infant mortality rate, twice as many babies die in this country as in Europe, Australia, Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Twice as, maybe, twice as many babies die just because we don't have adequate medical coverage for everybody. And the highest numbers, 184, that's got to be Afghanistan. But some of the countries in, in Africa then, the, all the yellow, the lowest yellow value is 50. And in the United States, the highest is, can only be 10. So five, five times, five to 15 times as many babies dying in the yellow countries as this green country. Infant mortality rate. Life expectancy. Oh, this is a fun one. I, I didn't make a new map this year, but, but every now and then I'll make a map to see the countries that I'm dead in. So yeah, all the yellow countries I'm dead. Uh, I'm about to be 55, but I didn't do a special map. But 
yeah, we could say just about any African country. If I was living as an African, I'd be dead now. That's fun. And Afghanistan, I'd be dead in Afghanistan too. Crude death rate. So again, this is the number of people dying per thousand people in the population. It's a weird, it just doesn't go with the other ones. So yeah, some of these countries have very, very low death rates. That's because their population is still really young. Population under 15. Uh, the yellow countries, 40 to 50% of the population is under 15. Uh, 33 to 40%, 27 to 33%, 20 to 27%. So you can see throughout Africa and the Mideast, a much larger percentage of the population is under 15. So that, these are the people that are about to start having kids. Another, another title for this map would be population that's about to start having babies. 40 to 50% of your population is under 15. You would expect to see a very high growth rate population over 65. That's a fun one. Going back and forth, now we've got the developed countries with advanced medical care. So we've got Western Europe, we've got Japan, US and Canada drop out. We're not, we're not in the running anymore. This is the dependency ratio. So this is the people, the percentage under 15 so they're too young to be working, and over 65, they're too old to be working. So it's the number of people who require care divided by the total number of people in the population. So the total number of people who require care in compared to the working population, about 50% of the population is either too young or too old. Here we have the lowest dependency ratios. So you'd expect to see fewer people under 15 and fewer people over 65. There's the over 65 again. That's a really interesting one. Uh, AIDS rates, the highest at this time was Botswana, 38%. Population number of people living with AIDS, South Africa and India, the highest numbers, millions and millions of millions. It's another chart just looking at different regions, comparing the natural increase of the world and then just dividing it into arbitrarily more and less developed, comparing the growth rate of Africa with Europe. There's, here's some good fun. Okay, so we've gone through the three revolutions. We've gone through the six demographic factors. Now we're going to hit the four or five phases of the demographic transition model. So the demographic transition model is just a model and it's just an idea. It was supposed to be a predictive model. It does not accurately predict what's happening in all countries equally well. It's supposed to go one way. You start off in stage one, go to two, then go to three, then go to four. It doesn't necessarily work that way. It's very accurate for explaining. So it's good at explaining what happened in Western countries. So Western Europe, the United States, Canada. It's not as good in not Western countries. So everybody else on the planet doesn't hold up. So yeah, I'll, yeah I'm going to have to figure out how to ask these on the test because this one's got five stages. They are cleverly labeled, named, whatever. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five. <clears throat> so we've got the name. We've got three variables. We've got birth rate, death rate, and the natural increase rate. So some sometimes, in fact, some of the other ones that we'll see will have a fourth, and that is just population, right? Because natural increase is a percent rate. It's not actual numbers. So typical stage one, the birth rate is high. The death rate is high. Famine, disease, a pre-agricultural society is where you would expect to find this. So you can see both the birth rate and the death rate, they're around 40, but because the natural increase rate is a birth rate minus the death rate, they cancel each other out. So the natural increase rate the natural increase rate. Oh, that's funny. 
Oh, they are they are showing hypothetical population, but they're not showing the natu the natural increase rate. Oh, I get it. The gap between the birth rate and the death rate is the natural increase rate. So very small increase rate. Stage two, something changes. Stage two in Western countries was the Industrial Revolution, allowing people to have better access to clean drinking water, uh, sanitation sewers, so people weren't drinking contaminated water. The death rate drops a whole bunch, but now, because the birth rate doesn't for a while, there's a societal lag time. So one of the reasons for a high birth rate is because there's a high child mortality rate. So the response is you have lots and lots of kids. So the kids live longer, but people still keep having as many kids for a while. Probably because the cultures that started having fewer kids immediately died out. But you can see that the gap between the death rate and the birth rate is very large. So the natural increase rate during stage two is very high. Very rapid increase in population. From stage two through stage three, you can see both stage two, stage three, the line, the slope of the population increase, it's still very rapid. In stage three, the birth rate, now there's social change. The birth rate starts coming down. Stage four, low growth, low death, low increase or stable increase. And then stage five, the birth rate keeps coming down. You might have negative or no population growth. So actually, I'm pretty, pretty, I'm pleased with this diagram because we've got low population, rapidly increasing, rapidly increasing, high population, high birth, high death, high birth. The death rate drops because in Western countries, the Industrial Revolution, and then there's social change. People move to cities, for example, in the West, and so... Your children that were assets on the farm are now liabilities in the city. I got to get their teeth straightened. I got to take them to the doctor. I got to buy books. I got to pay for school stuff. Now children in the city cost you. And one of the results, so the combination of children costing money and they're not dying. So if you start off with five kids, you're going to end up with five kids. And you didn't want five kids. You wanted three kids, which is why you started with five kids. Anyway. The birth rate comes down in stage three. Stage four is a zero population growth. Everything stabilizes, at least in the West, and then possibly moving on to stage five with decreasing population. Yeah, that's pretty good. So that's for the West. And uh, I stole this from another textbook. So now we've got, yeah, famines and disease outbreaks. So the birth rate, the death rate, they're both high, but they cancel each other out. So the, the growth rate is very low. Death rate drops, increase increases, birth rate drops, the increase rate drops, and then you get into stage four with low growth. This is totally accurate for England. It's great for describing the British experience. So we've got the Black Death, didn't really do a whole lot to population by whatever there's 1650. They're back up. Stage two, the industrial revolution drops the death rate. Stage three, the birth rate drops, and then it just kind of slides into stage four with zero population growth. But you'll notice the population increase takes off in stage two through stage three, and it doesn't stabilize till stage four. So the faster you can get a country through stage through stage two and three the lower the overall population is going to be. And that, that's key. Moving countries as fast as possible through stage two, stage three, and getting them into stage four. Here we've got a bunch of different examples, all on the same timeline, which is great. So now we can see that, for example, Germany and Sweden hit this very low birth rate. Well, yeah, that's the Great Depression. So... 60s or 70s, 60s or 70s. Chile, they're, they're not there. They're not even approaching it. Mauritius, maybe. China, maybe. So it's what I said before. Germany and Sweden, it's really, it's accurate for the Western countries. For the less developed world, for the non-Western countries, it's not, it's not accurate. It just doesn't hold up. So for example, 
uh, in one of the other videos that you'll see with Hans Rosling, he talks about what an amazing job other countries, developing countries have done. So you could look at this as how long did it take them? Yeah. How long did it take a country to move from stage one to stage four? So China and Iran, 10 or 11 years, the United Kingdom, 95 years, the US, 82 years. So we, we went from six children, a TFR of six to a TFR of three, and it took us 82 years. It took the United Kingdom 95 years. Bangladesh, it took them 20 years. Morocco, 22 years. Botswana, 24 years. So they're doing great. African countries, the developing countries, they're doing really, really well compared to the Western countries. The only difference is we hit it 1910, 1960, 1926. They're hitting it 2000, 1998, 94, 2002, 78, 96. So for them, they're just coming into stage four. Much of the developing world is just coming into stage four as we speak. How do you know what phase a country is in? Well, you could look at a population pyramid. So it's got population, usually males on one side, females on another side. And this is showing percent of the population. And it's a smooth graph, but there, there should be like three cohorts, 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, and then be 15 to 20. So they're, they're, people are chunked into cohorts, often of five-year cohorts or 10-year cohorts. So stage one, huge young population, very, very small old population. The country is growing rapidly because the bulk of the population is in the breeding section. The steeper, or rather the broader the base compared to the pointier the top, the broader the base, the pointier the top, the faster a country is growing. If the sides are vertical, it's stable. And if the bottom is pinched in, that means that country is decreasing. So this, over time, this country would decrease. You can see the birth rates coming down, the birth rates coming down. So over time, that country would decrease. This would be the fastest growing. This would be not just the slowest growing, they're actually decreasing. So population pyramids are great because you just look at it and you go, oh yeah, I know what's going on with that country. Comparing the United States to the Gambia, to Mexico, to Denmark. So if I asked you to rank them, by fastest to slowest, I would say Gambia is the fastest growing. Oh, and now you can see what I was talking about. Zero to four, five to nine, 10 to 14. So these are five-year cohorts. Uh, the Gambia is the fastest. Mexico is the second fastest. The U.S. is the third fastest. And Denmark, you can see from the last 50 years, their population has been decreasing. So population pyramids are incredibly useful. Super fast growth, contracting or decreasing growth. And then even with the country, you could look at different cities. So here we've got the U.S. as a whole, and you could compare Honolulu to Cedar Rapids to Unalashkaya to Lawrence, Kansas to Naples, Florida to Laredo. So looks like Laredo's growing the fastest, 94% Hispanic. Naples, Florida is inverted. 42% is old. So probably a big retirement community. People, old people are moving here from other places, <laughs> from Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, if you wanted to open a bar, I would open it in Lawrence, Kansas. If you wanted to open a senior water aerobics class, I would open it in Naples, Florida. If you were going to open a strip bar, I would do it in Unalashkaya, Alaska, because the gender ratio is so skewed. You can see how large I'll wait for that thing to disappear. You're useful, but you're not. So there in Unalashkaya, the, the two groups of people that I'm aware of in Unalashkaya are fishermen and military personnel at the weather station. So in Unalashkaya, where they say if you're a woman, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. Honolulu has got this interesting double bulge, and I think these are young active people and then retirees. Retirees... Yeah, I really like that one. That, that's a fun one. And then here's the U.S. over time. So you can see 1960, we were growing much more rapidly than, oh, 2040. That was a projection, but now it's here. So you can see, like, here was the baby boomers born in the 60s, the boomers growing out and gradually dying. 
Angola. Sure as heck has got to be a stage one country with super massive growth. Stage two, Cape Verde, off the coast, off the west coast of Africa. Yeah, like hardly anybody after 50. You can see the Great Depression, the famine as a result of the Great Depression, driving the birth rate down, driving the death rate up, driving the increase rate, going negative for a while. But then from 1950 to 2000, they're just like cranking along. Birth rate, death rate, they're fine. Stage two. Here's the Gambia. And you can see they're in stage two. They've been in stage two. In fact, it looks like the birth rate has taken a jump up. That's the opposite of what you want it to do. And as that birth rate has jumped up, so has the population increase. Again, percent under 14. Percent under 15. That's weird. Why would I do that? I must have been bored. Stage three, Chile. Uh, natural increase rate. Again, you can see the Great Depression. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. And under the Great Depression, it dropped the birth rate in many countries around the world because people got married later because you didn't start having kids until you got married. I am really interested to see if that linkage exists anymore across the world. I'm thinking it doesn't. I think that linkage between you get married first and then you have kids, I'm not sure that exists. But it would be interesting to see what hard economic times are doing to the birth rate. Stage three, and you can see they're not doing anything. In fact, in Chile, they had a military coup that was assisted by the United States uh, when Pinochet came to power and uh, changed the policies from one of promoting family planning to saying it's every Chilean's patriotic duty to make more Chileans. So they actually stopped the family planning programs and encouraged people to make more babies. Although after Pinochet was thrown out of power, that, that stopped. So the birth rate's coming back down. It looks like they might hit stage four eventually, but no time soon. Natural increase rate looks like it's about 1.3. Mexico... Mexico, uh, starting in the 70s, yeah, <clears throat> massive birth control, massive birth control efforts across, across Mexico. The total fertility rate was cut in half as a result of Mexican women starting to use contraceptives. Rapidly declining crude birth rate, moderately declining death rate, death rates coming down more slowly and a moderately decreasing natural increase rate. Looks like it's at least coming down to one, so the doubling time is just over 72 years still, stage three in Mexico. And then if we look at Denmark, Denmark's been in stage four since the 70s. A decreasing population, you can tell it's decreasing because the bottom part, the bottom bars are smaller than the upper bars. Denmark, stage four, typical of the Western experience, entering stage two as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And then entering stage three is the result of social change. You can also, so these, these are now one-year cohorts, so it's much more detailed. You can see, uh, where did they go? The birth deficit of World, World War II, losses of World War I, male losses in World War II, the birth deficit of World War I, the birth deficit of World War II. Here's the post-war baby boom. There's the baby boom echo when the baby boomers started having kids. Comparison of a faster growing and slower growing country. Oh, population pyramid for the home of Cornell University in 2010 with a huge young population. That's really interesting. And then watching the baby boomers age out and die again. Japan uh, has gone from 1950, looks like there may be stage three, to 2050, there have got to be stage five with decreasing growth. Demographic indicators. Uh, let's see what happens if we go there. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, yeah, the demographic indicators. Uh, so it's just broken down into continents and general regions, but you could take a look at mid year estimates of population. And then annual rate of increase, crew birth rate, crew death rate, and population density.
So, population issues. There are some who say there is no population problem. Life expectancy is higher today than ever before. The natural increase rate is decreasing. Food is globally more abundant and cheaper than any time in human history. Air and water are cleaner than they were in the 1970s. All of those are true. They also say science will figure it out, which is absolutely not true. I would say all of these things are true. Life expectancy is higher than other. Ironically, it's because people are living longer and they're not dying. That's part of the reason that population is increasing. The natural increase rate is decreasing, but it's still not zero. It's still not negative, so the population is increasing. Food is more abundant and cheaper today than ever before. Air and water are cleaner. Well, yeah, they were, but in the 1970s, we actually had a river catch fire. So it, not, I wouldn't use the 1970s as any sort of standard for goodness. Food more abundant and cheaper, that is true. And yet in the United States, we have in the developed countries as a result of processed foods and increased sugar in food, we have an obesity epidemic. So in the developed countries, people are eating the wrong kinds of food and the, in less developed countries, because of poverty and issues with food distribution, people are still starving to death. So we could feed the whole planet, but we're not. And that's because of capitalism, which we'll talk about later. Cornucopians are people who believe that it's wrong to limit population. They have the point of view that the more, the more the merrier. They say things like, you could fit the entire population of the United States into Texas and everybody would have however many square miles, which is true, but they're totally missing the point. Um, yeah, those, those, those 330 million Americans still need to breathe air, they still need to drink water, they still need to eat food, and there's spatial requirements for all of those things. So, problems, biodiversity, we are seeing an extinction epidemic that we haven't seen since the last mass extinction event that was caused by an object striking off the coast of Mexico roughly 65 million years ago, wiping out three quarters of the species on the planet. The rate of species loss is unmatched except for mass extinction events in Earth's history. All of the fisheries are at or over sustainable limits. So a fishery is like the tuna fishery or the cod fishery. It's the whole ecosystem that supports that particular type of fish. Like if you've been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, it's the Monterey Bay Aquarium and everything around it. All the touristy crap is uh, cannery row themed. Well, it's called Cannery Row because there used to be huge flocks of sardines, anchovies, tiny fish that they would put in cans, right? Well, they fished them all. They're gone now. The, the, the population collapsed. So there can't be a Cannery Row anymore because we ate all the fish. Well, we're doing the same thing except now with a larger, tastier fish. Tuna, cod, there's been moratoriums. Cod is made into fish and chips, for example. Tuna is made into sushi and other delicious things. But all those fisheries are being fished at or over, over sustainable limits. There is no, no large scale commercial fishing that's being done sustainably. Uh, wars, for example, Rwanda, uh, Syria, the, the conflict in the civil war in Syria, all of those exacerbated, made worse by high population. In Syria, there was environmental aspects as well. There was an ongoing drought that resulted in farmers having to abandon their homes and move to the city where they were out of work. So we're already seeing the beginnings of environmental change, uh, drought leading to conflict, wars, and then exodus. As we'll look at the Syrian, the five or six million people that have fled Syria as a result of the civil war there. Uh, land, we're not making new land and we're degrading the quality of the land that we have. Water, same thing. <laughs> Die off. You could figure out what the carrying capacity is for a species, like what the number of whatever uh, trout per a lake would be. You could figure that out, but the actual number of fish in the lake depends on a whole bunch of variables. And those fish in a naturally occurring population, they reproduce just like humans. Uh, the, the increase is very low, and then it turns the corner, you get massive increase, and they can exceed their carrying capacity temporarily. And after that, 
because the ecosystem has been damaged by the overpopulation, the next thing that happens is a population crash called die-off. The British Royal Society years ago said it's not prudent to rely on science to solve problems caused by rapid population growth, wasteful resource consumption, and harmful human practices. In other words, hey, humans, don't screw up the planet and then look at the scientists and say, okay, can you fix it now? The time to fix it was yesterday. The second best time to fix it is today. Ecological footprint is a, an idea was developed by researchers with my favorite names in science, Mathis Wackernagel and William Reese. And Wackernagel and Reese realized that to support human life requires space. There are, there are spatial aspects to our lifestyle that we can calculate out. So things like food, we know how many acres per person it takes to grow food. Although those numbers are different, depending on what you're eating. If you're eating beef, it takes more land than if you're eating a vegetarian diet. Uh, humans require land to treat their water. So every aspect of your life, there's a spatial component to it. It requires actual land someplace for you to live. And the amount of land largely depends on your choices. Okay, and now we're going to look at the ecological footprint calculator. Okay, so this is the ecological footprint calculator. Take the first step. Um, I'm just going to pretend I'm me. That's a, that's an easy thing for me to do. So, uh, how often do you eat? And frequently, yeah, infrequently. How much of the food do I eat is unprocessed, unpackaged, or locally grown? Almost all of it. Oh, yeah, all. 95%. Yeah. Housing. Duplex. Yeah. <laughs> and because because you can take it as if you're somebody who lives in another country, they have all kinds of funky options like straw, bamboo, brick, concrete, adobe, steel. Yeah. That's good. How big is your house? How many people do I have electricity? Yes. How efficient is my home? Very. What percentage of my electricity? All of it is coming from solar panels. Much less. How far do <laughs> How far does anybody travel anymore? Well, I was traveling. Yeah, that'd actually be good. How far do you travel by car or motorcycle every week? About 120 miles. If we average that over the year, though, yeah, let's say about 60 miles by scooter, zero. Average fuel economy, it's electric. So, good enough. How often do you travel? Uh, I'll say 10% of the time. Public transit, none. How many hours I haven't flown in some time? Holy mackerel. So if you wanted to live like me, uh, beat it. So if you wanted to live like me and something's got to be wrong, eat a largely vegetarian local diet, drive 60 miles a week in your electric car, live in an efficient house that has solar panels then everybody on earth could live like me. That is fantastic. So what I'd like you to do, and I'll, I'll send you the link and let you know what the assignment is. Uh, based on your lifestyle, I'm curious how many earths it would take to support you. All right, that was the ecological footprint calculator. Uh, and I'm, yeah, I'm really surprised that I got it down to 0.8 planets. Usually I've had to pretend to move to San Francisco and become a vegan bike messenger in order to get it down. Maybe it's the electric car. I don't know. So ecological footprint, an incredibly handy tool for determining your environmental impact. Let's talk about Robert Malthus. Robert Malthus was one of the most influential clergymen and economists ever. And he identified two, he, he had two ideas. He said, number one, people need to eat 
And number two, people like sex. Although, because he was a clergyman in the 1700s, he didn't say it like that. He said, food production increases linearly, whereas population increases exponentially. He's absolutely right. Both of these are completely true. Critics of Malthus point out that we all haven't starved to death yet, therefore he's wrong. They say, yeah, we haven't, we haven't died yet. Marx and Engels looked at Malthus and said, no, 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 no. It's not just going to be numbers. Numbers aren't the problem. Because we, Marx and Engels witnessed the Industrial Revolution. They saw how dramatically yields improved for farmers that were using machinery. So they thought, no, no, no. There's more than enough for everybody. Technology, and that's what technology will provide a solution because of their experiences in the Industrial Revolution. They saw what happened in factories. They saw what happened in agriculture. And they said, no, no, no. The problem is going to be unequal distribution. And indeed, they're exactly right. There is more than enough food to feed everybody in the world. We just don't. Later, later people, neo means new. Neo-Malthusian said, yeah, it's not going to be food. Population is going to increase exponentially and we'll run out of something, but it's not going to be food. It's probably going to be waste sinks. Like all the pollution that we make, the earth just won't be able to absorb it anymore and everything will be too nasty for us to live. IPAT was uh, a more sophisticated Malthusian view. You could also view it as <laughs> IPAT is less sophisticated than the environmental footprint. IPAT is more sophisticated than Malthus. So this was in the 1950s, 1960s. Paul and Aaron Ehrlich were biologists at Stanford. They were butterfly researchers, and they realized that they had a problem because they couldn't study their butterflies because they'd go back to these tropical islands, and the butterfly's habitat had been converted to agriculture for export, and so the butterflies were all extinct. And they realized, ah, maybe rather than butterflies, we should focus our attention on humans, because if, we, if humans keep doing this and everything goes extinct, we won't have a planet worth living on. So they started looking at overpopulation. And overpopulation in the 1950s and the 1960s in the United States had a lot of racism in it, and it had a lot of pointing at less developed countries and saying, oh, it's not us. It's not the upper middle class white people. It's all those brown people in India or all those yellow people in China. They're the problem. And Ehrlich, the Ehrlichs said, it's not numbers. They said the environmental impact is a function of the population, but not all populations have equal impact. The impact of that population is a function of how wealthy they are and how high their technology is. So if you're in a poor country and you're growing rice and you're living in a mud hut, your environmental impact is going to be incredibly low, as opposed to if you live in a country where you're making enough money that you can afford to buy a new pair of iPods every week because you can't remember to take them out of your, out of your pocket before you do the laundry so you keep trashing them. So the more money a country has, the higher technology, the higher technology, the higher the pollution, the higher the affluence, the more waste, the more spending. So Paul and Ann Ehrlich said, it's not numbers. The problem is us. So the numbers, th this isn't something that you plug numbers into. And I'm going to have to back up and say, the ecological footprint calculator, you definitely plug numbers in and get an actual answer in equivalent Earths to support your lifestyle. Paul and Ann Ehrlich you just got to get more or less impact. It's a qualitative, not quantitative. Quantitative means you can, it's numbers, qualitative. You're just describing the quality. Is it hot? Is it cold? That would be qualitative. Quantitative would be its temperature is 100 Celsius degrees or 100 degrees Celsius rather. Uh, two other issues, inequality of consumption and gender. So I'm just going to talk about gender for a while. Obviously not everybody has access to buy the same amount of stuff. But not yet. Gender, not everybody, not everybody is born into society. Not everybody is treated like society equally. You might have noticed that men and women in society are often treated differently. So the poor, they're not polluting. They're not buying anything. They're not doing anything. Uh, it's the richest 
Fifth, the richest 20% that is responsible for the vast majority of all the pollution on Earth. It's us. The richest fifth, way, way, way more pollution, way more money. The poorest have the highest fertility rates, and often the poor lack reproductive freedom due to... Re <laughs> The poor often lack reproductive freedom due to the patriarchy, male domination, male-dominated religions, male-dominated societies. It's men. Women represent over half the Earth's population. They own less than 1% of the property. They earn less than 1% of the money. They represent two-thirds of the illiterate. Every single time things are bad economically, we know exactly who's going to be affected the worst, and that's women and children. Globally, women and children are, are uh, more affected by poverty, more affected by pollution, more affected by these issues than men. Women represent one-third the labor force, and yet they do an estimated $11 trillion worth of uncounted work. The entire global domestic product it was at the time of this stat of this statistic was only 23 trillion so if you added up all the money that everybody and all the companies all over the world make 23 trillion if you add up all the work that women do that doesn't count so that's like um, stay at home parents they don't do work according to economists because nobody's paying them cash money if you're not getting paid cash money by a company you're not doing work that's the way the economy these statistics work. So women do $11 trillion worth of uncounted work. 1994 United Nations Conference in Cairo on women's issues. They had two goals. They wanted to improve the rights, the opportunities, the economic status of women. They rejected coercive measures at the same time. So their two goals were to improve the status of women and rejecting coercive measures. By coercive measures, oh, I'm not going to talk about that yet. Uh, by coercive measures, I mean things like forced sterilization or forced abortions. So gender equality, education is key, education is key, education is key, but not for the reasons you think. It's because in societies where women aren't educated, the reason they don't go to school is because they're not valued. Women have to be valued by a society in order for them to go to school. So before they can go to school, the societal change has to take place first. The social change happens and the society says, oh yes, of course women are human beings and are deserving of education just like men. After the societal change happens, then they go to school. So looking at Botswana, Women with no education had on average 5.9 kids. Women with only four to six years of education have 3.1. Senegal, zero years of education, seven children, 10 years of education, 3.6 children. These numbers are fairly typical. Every place in the world, when women are given the ability to control their fertility, the birth rate is cut in half. I'll just say that again, because it's super important. When women are allowed to control their fertility, the birth rate is cut in half. Same thing happened in Mexico, dropping from seven children to three and a half children. So this is the sex ratio at birth, males to females. This is the sex ratio at birth, average years of schooling for women, no data available for a lot of African countries. The rest of them looks like it's less than four years. India, four to six years. Uh, China, six to eight years. And then lots of European countries, North America, Average number of years of schooling for women is greater than 10. Total fertility rate in Africa. So you can compare the countries. The countries that don't have any data on sending their women to school are also the countries that have the highest fertility rates. More than six, fewer than four. Maternal mortality. This is women that die per 100,000 live births. And in the U.S. and Western Europe, and Japan, Australia, New Zealand, below 20. Throughout Africa, 300 and above. Afghanistan, 300 and above. Family planning programs in Ireland. The Catholic Church has been dominant for a long, long time. 
Uh, they are just recently getting access to abortion in Ireland. Uh, also, oh man, I want to say it was Venezuela. Ooh. Yeah, I want to say Venezuela just got access to, to abortion. So in Ireland, 2018, abortion was legalized in Ireland in 2018, and abortion was just legalized in Venezuela this year. Another aspect of family planning programs is access. 300 million women worldwide lack access. Some of them, it's financial. Some of them, it's physical. Like if you live in a remote village, how are you supposed to... If you live in a re remote village that doesn't have a store that provides contraception, how are you supposed to do that? Are you going to take a six-hour bus ride to the capital to take whatever tiny amounts of actual cash you have? Assuming your husband or partner allows you to buy the contraceptives, yeah, it's just not going to happen. They lack access, and often that access is just simple physical access. Some countries' family planning programs don't cover teens and unmarried women, operating under the assumption that the only people having sex are married couples. To provide family planning globally would cost about $17 billion, which is nothing. Ab ab compared to military budgets, compared to uh, people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, increases in wealth, $17 billion is nothing. China, by coercion, so now we get to talk about... Uh, the other goal of the UN conference in Cairo in 1994 was uh, saying that they did not approve of coercive measures. In China, they had a one-child policy where you had one child. The Communist Party would keep track of your menstrual cycle. If you skipped, if you were late, you got a pregnancy test. If you already had one child and you were pregnant, you had an abortion. There were some ways around this. So twins... China leads the world in unusual twin births now. If you could get a doctor to sign off that the second child was in fact a twin, you got to keep them both. So China has many, many cases of twins being born years apart. So as a result of this, the policies have been infanticide with, because of, again, patriarchy, that you want boys, boys are valuable, girls are worthless. China and India, very similar very, very similar outcome that because of societal views on women, boys are valued. So if you have a baby girl and if, if you are in China, if you are in India, in one of these regions where they are uh, reducing, attempting to reduce the population and you have the money, you would go to a clinic and have a sex determination performed. And if it's a girl, you'll have an abortion. If it's a boy, you don't. In one study, they looked at 800 abortions in one clinic. 799 were baby girls. One of them was a baby boy. Uh, China, there's, there's 60 to 100 million missing girls. We know. We know from studying human populations what the ratio of boys to girls at birth is. Slightly more boys should be born. They're more fragile. They die in... Uh, their early stages more than girls. Girls are built better. So uh, we know what the sex ratio at birth should be for a natural population. And looking at China, they're missing 60 to 100 million young girls because of abortion, because of infanticide. India, the sex ratios are also getting skewed because now people can afford to go get uh, sex determination. And if it's a girl, they have an abortion because you only want a boy. Uh, Guatemala. During the Civil War in Guatemala, indigenous, indigenous Mayan women were sterilized by the government in an act of genocide. The government was trying to eliminate the Mayan population. And one of the ways they did that is if Mayan women went in to give birth in a government health clinic, they were sterilized against their will. Uh, they, they weren't able to give consent. Same thing in China. After the invasion of Tibet by China in 1959, uh, one of their policies has been to eliminate the indigenous Tibetan population in favor of Chinese people. And one of the ways that they've done that is through sterilization of Tibetan women in government health clinics. So here we've got the sex ratio at birth. The natural ratio should be 105 babies born at birth in China. 105 boys per 100 females. China, that looks like 121 boys per 100 females. Armenia, 
Azerbaijan, Soviet Georgia, that's Soviet, former Soviet Georgia, not the state of Georgia. But you can see in all these countries, the sex ratio has been really dramatically skewed. Here we have, again, China, sex ratios at birth, and India, showing that if you're in the capital city, you're going to a doctor, you're going to a clinic, and out in the provinces, the sex ratio is closer to the natural ratio where those abortions or infanticides maybe aren't taking place at the same rate. Women using family planning uh, in the West, well, some countries in the West, uh, China and France and England and the Scandinavian countries, North America, 75% or more, Africa, less than 25% using some sort of family planning. Same thing with Afghanistan. Interesting, Iran is so huge. I'd love to get more information on that. The crude birth rate. So has it gone up? Has it gone down? Green countries, it's increased. In the purple countries, it's decreased dramatically. That's interesting. The crude birth rate declined 15 and above. So yeah, crude birth rate is coming down across the world. Family planning methods in Germany. It looks like most people are on the pill. In Nigeria, most people aren't doing anything. In China, it's a combination of female sterilization and IUDs. Thailand. So you're going to watch a video on Thailand. It's one of my faves. Uh, Thailand is a success story. Thailand is an example of how it should be done. That family planning worked in China in 1971. 3.2% was the natural increase rate for a doubling time of 22 years. Total fertility rate, 6.4 children per woman. Government came out with a new policy. They wanted to improve health care for women and children first. That's where they started. They increased women's literacy rates up to 90%. They increased women's rights and economic roles. They got the cooperation of the Buddhist community to do things like bless contraceptives, not just to approve contraceptives, not just to not, not just to not speak out, as in Ireland and some of the other Catholic countries where the church spoke out against abortion. Uh, in Thailand, right, because if you don't get pregnant, you don't need an abortion. So if you provide people with family planning, you decrease abortions as well. So in Thailand, they got the cooperation of the Buddhist community. And this guy, Mekai Virivedaya, you'll see him in the, in the video. He founded the PCDA in 1974. I thought this was a joke. I, I didn't think it was true, although I left it in the notes because it was funny, that on New Year's Day, they call it in Thailand, Cops and Rubbers Day. And I'm all that. The Thai language is so different from English. There's no way it's a funny joke if you translate that into Thai. Cops and robbers, cops and robbers. On, the, on New Year's Day, the traffic police in Thailand actually do give away contraceptives. On the king's birthday, you can get a free vasectomy in Thailand. They have contraceptive carts. Uh, like if you, back in the day, back in the day when people still went outside in groups, if you went to a Kings game, there might be people selling stuff outside the game, right? Like t-shirts or little rolling carts selling whatever they sell on those rolling carts. Well, the PCDA said, if there's going to be people, we want to be there and we want to give out contraceptives. So anytime there was a festival, a gathering of a, a gathering of any kind, they would show up and give away contraceptives. I love this one. And I'll just give you the, the, uh, American analogy, it would be like if you took an Uber or a Lyft, that the insurance for that driver would be paid by the PCDA as long as that driver gave away contraceptives. So you could actually get like birth control pill refills from your taxi driver. Yeah, I took a Lyft over and I also picked up some condoms because that's just the way it works in Thailand back, well, starting in the 1970s. Did it work? Hell yes. 1996, 64% of women were using contraceptives. The more developed country averages 52%. They'd gotten the natural increase rate down to 1.4% for a doubling time of 51 years. The total fertility rate was down to 2.2 children because it was a grassroots effort. It was not a government top-down effort where the federal government stepped in and said, this is what you're going to do. It was done by volunteers on the ground, embedded in the communities, helping their neighbors in their communities. It was a grassroots effort, and that is the key to successful family planning programs. 
So there's the video, How Mr. Condom Made Thailand a Better Place. This is part of your um, population videos response paper. Oh, this is a video by Hans Rosling. It's also on the list. You're supposed to watch this video, answer some questions about Hans. And he created this data visualization tool called Gapminder. You're also going to have assignment, an assignment using Gapminder to try to get uh, demographic data. It's an outstanding video. Another video by Hans Rosling. That's right. It's another video by Hans. It's another video by Hans. It's another video by Hans. And it's a video about birth control by Melinda Gates. Uh, this is Bill Gates' wife. She is doing her best to blow through as much of his money as she can uh, by providing contraceptives and um, vaccinations worldwide. So she's also on the list of videos. That's it for the population part. The second part is migration. M much easier far. There's, there's fewer words, there's fewer details, fewer ideas. With migration, it's just people moving around. So migration, we're going to define that as a permanent move to a new location. If you're emigrating, you're leaving. If you're immigrating, you're coming. So, right. So my great, 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 great grandparents were emigrants from Cornwall in England, and they were immigrants to St. Paul in Minnesota. On my dad's side, they emigrated from Norway, and they immigrated to St. Paul in Minnesota. Net migration is the out minus in. Yeah. So you take the number of people leaving, subtract the number of people coming, and that gives you the net migration number. Right. So there's push factors that make you leave a place, and there's pull factors that draw you to a place. Push factors, pull factors. Mobility is defined as one's ability to move from place to place. Not everybody has mobility. Not everybody has the ability to move from one country or within one country, right? Not all mobility is migration. There's voluntary migration when you choose and invol involuntary migration when that decision has been made for you. The forcible relocation of Native Americans in the United States was an involuntary migration. About 270 mil migrants, 270 million migrants in 2020. So here's a video. Uh, you, might, you might have remembered this, uh, that a climate change-fueled drought and U.S. Fed violence drove thousands of people from Central America to North America. This is a preview for North America of climate refugees. There are going to be hundreds of millions of people who are going to be who are going to be forced to leave their homes and travel to entirely new areas because the climate has changed that much. And like I said, as a preview, we got thousands of people moving out of Central America as the result of climate change and political destabilization uh, beginning. Hard to say where to where to, where to begin U.S. involvement in Central America, going back to Teddy Roosevelt, going back to the 1950s with United Fruit, going back to the U.S. military running death squads out of Honduras and El Salvador. Uh, yeah. So as a result of U.S. involvement in supporting corrupt right-wing administrations and climate change, thousands of people were forced to leave. So that would be the push factor would be an environmental factor. It's a push factor. It's an environmental factor. And then the pull factor, where do they go, is probably an economic one. They went someplace where they thought they might be able to get a job. So international could be voluntary, could be forced. More definitions drives me crazy. At the beginning of every chapter, there's like all these new words you got to learn. So refugee, somebody that forced to migrate. An asylum seeker is somebody who, for political reasons, has migrated and they're hoping to be officially recognized and given refugee status or asylum seeker status within that new country. You could also move within your country, in which case you're an internally displaced person. If you had to... In California, we saw this with the wildfires, for example, the campfire in Paradise. The people that left California, left Paradise and moved to other places in California would have been internally displaced persons. They weren't international migrants. They were internal, internally displaced persons. 
the total population of refugees globally right now, 2020, is about 26 million. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees has about 20 million. Uh, in Israel, there's about 5.6 million Palestinian refugees that have been forced to leave because of the apartheid regime in, in Israel. Uh, about almost 80 million forcibly displaced persons worldwide. Almost 80 million people are some sort of refugee. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees has a really cool web page with this nice infographic. So you can see uh, over time the numbers of migrants jumping dramatically. 80% of the world's displaced are in countries affected by acute food insecurity or malnutrition. 4 million stateless people. 3 million Venezuelans, 4 million asylum seekers, 45 million internally displaced people. Refugee sending countries as of 2012, uh, we had Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan leading, leading the way, Congo. Refugee receiving countries, uh, there you have it. Uh, Germany receiving a lot, Pakistan and Iran receiving hundreds of thousands of refugees. Net migration, the blue countries gained people, the orange countries lost people. That's not a great map. Annual net migration, countries with the largest rates back from 2015 to 2020. Venezuela, economic refugees out of Venezuela, Syria, uh, refugees fleeing the civil war and also the climate destabilization there. This is from uh, the Fed. The Federal Reserve has some really cool, really cool tools to view refugees and other economic. Uh, so yeah, the link is in the slides. If you mouse over it, it should take you there. And then you can change, change the time. Like this is 2008 through 2012. And at the time, the largest loss of people was, was out of Syria. The largest gain was into Turkey and the United States. And I thought, oh, how is that different now? So the newest values we have are 2017. The red countries are losing people. The blue countries are gaining people. So the U.S. and China have gained 4 million. I'm sorry, and Russia. China, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, and Syria have all lost more than 200,000. Also, Mexico has lost over 200,000 people. Mapping refugees, over 6 million out of Syria, almost 4 million out of Venezuela, almost 3 million out of Afghanistan, and then we've got Sudan, South Sudan, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Myanmar, a million people out of Myanmar. It's going to be interesting. I'll bet those are mainly the uh, Rohingya Muslims that are a persecuted minority in Myanmar. I would think that number will continue to go up because just today there was a military coup in Myanmar and Aung San Suu Kyi, the, uh, the leader of Myanmar, was deposed by a military takeover. I think things are going to get worse for the Muslims as a result. And then refugee host countries, Germany taking in over a million, Sudan, Lebanon, Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all of them taking in just about a million each. Uganda taking in about a million people. Colombia probably taking in Venezuelans. Thank you, Amnesty International. So I put a link down here. This diagram is showing people moving from one place to another place. So here is the full, yeah, you can play around with it. If you click on a region, it then breaks it out. So you could see, for example, South Asia, uh, the flow was 1.1 million from South Asia to the United States. Uh, a million people moved from the US to Europe from 2005 through 2010. Fortunately, that's the newest, the newest data we have. Latin America to the US, moving into the US, three and a half million. I would play around with that you might find things that you think are interesting. Soviet Union, nobody's moving out of there. West Asia, South Asia, India. Yeah. So yeah, I hope you play around with the refugee flow calculator. That's an interesting. Uh, speaking of migrants, they're typically young. They're typically men. 
typically young men are migrants. So guest workers in other countries, typically young men. Refugees, these are all those numbers that I gave you before. 70 million refugees globally, 26 million refugees, 41 million internally displaced people, about 4 million asylum seekers. Uh, you can check out the Wikipedia link for illegal immigration to the United States. It's decreased dramatically. It's very complicated. Part of it was Trump's crackdown on the border along with ICE. Another part was changing economic status in the United States and Mexico. Like the idea that that the same factor could be a push factor and a pull factor. Economics could be a push factor. If I can't get a job here, but I can there, economics are going to be a push factor from my home. They're going to be a pull factor to the new place. Uh, all of those economics, politics, everything that's changed as a result, immigration from Mexico into the United States is way, way down. Syria, many, 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 many million, uh, almost 7 million refugees from Syria, Many of them going to Egypt, to Jordan, 655,000, Iraq, Turkey, over 3 million into Iraq. More details on the flood of people from Syria. Another map with refugees, 1998 to 2002. So this is ancient history now. Oh, although 98, 2002, we're still seeing Gulf War... And this would be Afghanistan under the Taliban would be what's going on at that point. Uh, Kurdish refugees, Palestinian refugees, hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees in Israel and outside of Israel. One of the reasons for that is the increasing loss of Palestinian land as Israel takes over illegally land that is Palestinian. Here we have the Gaza Strip and the remains of Palestine. And you can see getting fragmented. This, this is continuing. This is much worse today that uh, in Israel right now, they're, they are vaccinating Jewish Israelis. They are not vaccinating Palestinian Israelis. So the the political and religious oppression in of the Palestinian people by Israel continues. Internal migration, it can be voluntary, it can be forced, it's the same deal. Twice as many internally displaced people as refugees total. Internal migration, uh, more people looks like leaving the West to the South than people coming from the South to the West. flow from cities to suburbs, from suburbs to cities, from cities to rural areas, non-metropolitan to suburbs, <laughs> whatever. Uh, looks like the overall trend is people moving from cities to suburbs. We'll talk way, way, way more about that when we talk about cities, urban areas, toward the end of the entire semester. Internal migration within Mexico from southern Mexico into northern Mexico. Yeah, I don't even know what to do with this. Net domestic migration gain in 2011 and 2016, loss in 2011 and 2016. I don't really... Oh, right, because everything positive is a gain, everything negative is a loss. Yeah, it's a problem with the symbology. I would like to see this broken out into lighter and darker blue, lighter and darker red, so that you could see, well... Yeah, people moved, but it was only a few, right? This is just treating everything the same. I actually don't know what's going on. Although, sack and yellow, uh, no change. Loss of the rural areas, gain of... Uh, Florida, gaining in Florida. Tennessee, gaining in Tennessee. Global migration, lots of people coming to the United States two centuries of immigration. So here we have prejudice against Europeans, followed by prejudice against people from Asia, and now prejudice against people from Latin America. More flows of refugees. Internally displaced people, odds are if you're internally displaced, you're probably in Africa. 
and that's it for this chapter. Uh, yeah, it's big. It's massive. There's all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of details. There's all kinds of concepts, but it's incredibly important. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, let me know.